Yeah. 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 systems, which we saw last time. So linear systems are generally represented in terms of a matrix A, a vector of unknowns X, and a vector of known values B. And our goal is to try to figure out for known A and B what X makes the equation AX equals B true. In the general case, we might assume that we have M equations and N unknowns. And what length is that going to make the vector X? Yeah, so in this case, x would have length n, and we're going to end up with a result that has length m, so b is going to be a length n vector. And what we're going to want to do then is come up with some solution where we can figure out what x is for any given n and b. And this is something that is really one of the fundamental operations of any sort of numerical computing, and it'll come up quite a bit in this class and various topics we're going to be looking at. So the immediate use of this is that it's going to come up in the context of continuous optimization. So it comes up in some of our methods for general or unconstrained continuous optimization that we'll be seeing next Tuesday. So in these methods, we'll be trying to solve or, or find typically a minimum of some kind of function or a maximum of a function, canonically of several variables. So linear system solving is a key part or key operation of the main methods for that. And also for what's called constrained optimization. And we actually saw a special case of that previously, linear programming. So we had seen integer linear programming. We'll see the non-integer version next Thursday. And this is another case where the basic tools of linear system solving come in quite a bit in that context. It's also an important tool for analyzing various simulation problems. So analysis of both continuous, so that would typically be differential equation simulation and also discrete, which generally for us will mean markup model simulation. And finally, through these things, it'll fit into the problem of model inference. So very often, what we will see with respect to model inference is problems related to optimizing a set of parameters relative to some kind of data. So we'll often come back to the same kinds of methods that we're using for models posed for optimization purposes. And we can see a simple example of that to kind of motivate to some of the work we'll be doing using a particular kind of model inference problem known as a regression problem, which is a typical way that we would uh, go about trying to learn a model that fits a simple set of data. And in this case, what we would typically assume is that we have a data set that is a function of some independent variables. So maybe we've got some function f of variables a1, a2, a3, through, let's say, some a sub m. And 
maybe we can measure that that has some value B when we plug in particular values of these coefficients. And it might be that we've experimentally tried varying these uh, independent variables. So we have different instances of this, so an F where we plugged in a value A11, A12, A13, etc., up to A1M, and we've measured a value B1, and we've done the same thing with an A21, A22, etc., up through A2M, measured a value B2, and so forth. And what we want to do is figure out the function that performs this mapping. So the function that's going to tell us what value of B we should get for any set of values of A. So in a biological context, an example might be that maybe we are trying to grow some bacterium and we are interested in optimizing its growth rate. And maybe we observe that its growth depends on what uh, nutrients we grow it on. So maybe we can grow it on glucose or fructose or lactose or whatever else we want to add to the media. And these might be our independent variables. So we can have some amount of A11, A12, A13, A21, in a different experiment, A22, A23. And for any combination of these nutrients in the media, we measure some growth rate. and so forth, and what we want to do is figure out how growth rate relates to the amounts of these different nutrients in the media. And a typical way we would pose a problem like this is in terms of a linear system. So a simple way of posing this would be to say that maybe we propose that the growth rate B is related to the amounts of the nutrients by some linear function. So maybe there's a basal growth rate C0, and then some component C1 of the amount of A1 we have, and C2 of the amount of A2, et cetera, for however many nutrients we have, let's say CK, AK. And we would then want to try to figure out what these coefficients C should be in order to match our observed experimental values to the predictions of the model. So that would be what we would call a linear regression formula, and it's one example of where we would want to use this kind of thing in model inference. So any questions about this yet? Okay, so if we were trying to do something like this, we would commonly have some set of experimental measurements, as I showed here, and that would imply a set of linear equations or a linear system. So we would say that there's some C0 plus C1, A11, plus C2, A12, etc. CK, A1K equals B1. That would be the result of one experiment. C0 plus C1, A21, plus C2, A22, etc. Up through CK, A2K equals B2 and so on down to, let's say, C0 plus C1, a M1 plus C2, A M2, etc., up through C K, A M K equals B sub M. We could then rewrite that in terms of linear algebra notation to say that we are trying to multiply a matrix A by a vector X to get a vector B. And well, what should be our vector X here? What are the unknowns? Yeah, the, the C's are our unknowns. So we're going to want to put this in a form where we've got a matrix times a vector of the C values equals a vector, which in this case would be the B values. And we can write that as follows. So let's put in the C values here. And I'm just going to throw in C0, C1, up through CK, since we know that's supposed to be there. Here we will have our B values, so let's say one up through B sub M. And we want to put in whatever we need the matrix to be to make it equivalent to these equations. So what should go in the upper left corner here? Yeah, one. So we want to say that in this first equation, we have a coefficient of one applied to C zero. And then we would have our observed experimental value A11 applied to C1. A12 applied to C2, and so forth, up through A1K, 
And in the second row, we would have a 1, a 2, 1, a 2, 2, through a 2K, 1, a 3, 1, a 3, 2, through a 3K, and so forth, until we get to the final row, so 1, AM1, AM2, up through AMK. So this whole thing then would be our matrix A, this is our vector X, and this is our vector B, and we're trying to solve the linear system AX equals B. Right, so suppose we have this particular system, and we have a, well, let's say we have a very large number of experiments. So we've run the experiment, let's say, uh, 2K times. What kind of system is that? How would we describe that? Well, let's say we've run it exactly K plus one times. What we would have then would be a full rank system. So if it's 2K, what would it be? In that case, we would have more equations than unknowns, so we would have an overdetermined system. So full rank if we have k plus one experiments, overdetermined if we have greater than k plus one, and then of course underdetermined if we have less than k plus one experiments. And what we're going to be spending most of today on is actually the full rank case. And then we'll see, hopefully, towards the end of the lecture today, what to do if we're in these other cases, and what we can do if we're in the overdetermined or the underdetermined case. Usually, you actually want to be in the overdetermined case, but solving for the overdetermined case actually uses the tools for solving for the full rank case as kind of a key subroutine. So really, the understanding the full rank case is kind of the crucial one. That's the main thing I wanted to talk about today. Right, so is this clear to everyone? Okay, so there's a classic method many of you are likely to have seen in a uh, high school algebra class that you can use to solve these sorts of linear systems. And this is known as Gaussian elimination. Gaussian elimination is not usually the thing you would want to use to solve a hard linear system in practice. So if you're actually working with a difficult model, and difficult might mean that A is, a, I don't know, a million elements matrix or something like that, probably Gaussian elimination is not the thing you would want to use for that. But I think it's good to know about because it's, it's easy to understand. If you ever need to quote something up or just do this by hand, it's very easy to use. And it also does feed into some more advanced methods, so understanding how it works. You know, there are applications where you'd actually use versions of Gaussian elimination. So what I want to do is start by walking through how Gaussian elimination works, and then later we'll get to some more advanced methods that you're more likely to use for a hard system in practice. But the basic idea behind Gaussian elimination is that we're going to take our initial equation, our initial system AX equals B, and we're going to try to use a series of linear transformations to turn that into an equivalent system, IX equals, let's say, B prime. And once we've done this, I is the identity matrix, so IX is X, and then we know X must be equal to B prime. So that's basically the idea behind what we're going to be trying to do here. So with Gaussian elimination, we would start with whatever matrix we're trying to solve. And I'll just put an example here so we can walk through this. Let's say we're looking at the matrix 2, 4, 2, 3, 2, 3, minus 1, 0, 2, times some unknown vector x is equal to, let's say, 16, 16, 5. And what we would typically do is just to try to make the notation a little cleaner, the sort of a standard way you would write this. So you kind of get rid of the x and you just try to convert it to the numbers 242, 323, three, minus 102, and then we'll just write a bar here and write b on the other side of the bar. So it's kind of a shorthand for this system here. And then we're going to try to do a series of transformations to turn the left side of this 
into an identity matrix. So put ones on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. So is that clear to everyone? Okay, so there's a general process to do this, and the basic steps are as follows. We're going to start by trying to put ones on each diagonal element in sequence, and then use those ones to subtract out multiples of a row from the rows below it to put zeros below that diagonal element. And that'll be the first half of Gaussian elimination. And we would typically start that by looking at the first row and trying to put a one in the diagonal element of the first row. And the way we will do that is by simply scaling the first row of the problem. So we have a 2, 4, 2, 16 in the first row, if we count B. We want a 1 in the first position. So we're going to scale the entire row by 1 half to get 1, 2, 1, 8. And then the other rows we just leave as they are. So 3, 2, 3, 16, minus 1, 0, 2, 5. And that's the first step of the Gaussian elimination. And we then will take this first row, where we now have a 1 in the first position, and subtract multiples of it from the other rows to put zeros below that diagonal element. So in other words, we'll take this row, 1, 2, 1, 8, and we will subtract a multiple of this from this to make the 3 here a 0. So to subtract the right multiple, what we want to do is take three times the first row and subtract that from the second row. And we know that that will put a zero in this position. And then we have to work through the math to figure out what that would put in all of the other positions of the matrix. And what this will come out to if we do the math is we've got two here, we're subtracting two times three from that, so we get a minus four. We've got one here, we're multiplying that by three, subtracting that from three. We get a zero here, and we're going to end up with a minus eight in the B place. And if we do the same thing here, what multiple of the top row should we subtract from the bottom row? Negative one. Yeah, negative one. We just add the top row to the bottom row, and what that's going to give us is zero, two, three, thirteen. So that's the first step of the Gaussian elimination. And we then repeat that on the next diagonal element. So we're going to scale the matrix to put a 1 in this element. So we end up with 1, 2, 1, 8, 0, 1, 0, 2. And then the bottom row stays the same for the moment, 0, 2, 3, 13. And then we're going to subtract multiples of this middle row from the bottom row in order to put a 0 in this position. In this case, what we'll end up with is 1, 2, 1, 8, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 9. Okay, so what's the next thing we should do then? in the diagonal element of the last row. And in this case, what that's going to involve is dividing the last row by 3. So we end up with 1, 2, 1, 8, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 3. So we've now got something that looks like an identity matrix on the diagonal and below the diagonal. And we then need to reverse directions and start putting zeros above the diagonal. So we want zeros everywhere, the long end above the diagonal. And it's more or less the same process as we were doing before in reverse. We already have ones on the diagonals. We don't need to do any more scaling at this point. But we'll want to subtract multiples of lower rows from the upper ones to put zeros above the diagonal. So at this point, we're going to subtract multiples of the bottom row from the second and first rows. So the second row, we already have the zero above the diagonal. We don't need to do anything there, so we can leave that alone. But the first row, we need to subtract a multiple of the third row from it to turn this one into a zero. 
To do that, we would subtract one times the third row from the first row, and that is going to give us the second row from the first row. So what multiple of the second row should we subtract from the first row? The two. So we're subtracting two times this from this, so we'll get one, zero, zero, and this will become one. And if we then convert that back into linear algebra notation, what we have now done is turn this into an identity matrix. So we've got i times x equals the vector 1, 2, 3. And that tells us that x is 1, 2, 3. So that basically is Gaussian elimination. So everyone follow this? OK, so there are a couple of things I wanted to say about this. One of these is that we can actually represent every step of this, every step of Gaussian elimination, as a linear algebra operation in itself. In particular, each step of Gaussian elimination can actually be represented as a matrix multiplication. I want to illustrate how that works. So if we are doing a scaling step, so for example, here we're scaling the matrix by multiplying one of the rows by one half, that's something we can represent by multiplying it by a diagonal matrix that has the following form. So if we take our matrix A, the left-hand side, and we just multiply it by the matrix that has one half here, B, one, 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 et cetera, with zeros everywhere below the diagonal, zeros everywhere above the diagonal, then we should be able to verify that whatever is in this matrix A, each column we take out of it, we would end up multiplying one half by the first element, one by the second, one by the third, and so forth. So whatever this column was, we multiply the first element by one half, we leave the other elements alone, or in other words, we end up scaling just one row by one half. Is that clear to everyone? We also wanted to scale the first element of B, so we need to turn that from a 16 into an 8. And actually, multiplication by the same matrix will do that as well. So 0, 0 times 16, 16, and we have there 5. If we do the multiplication through, what this is going to give us is 8, 16, 5. So if we refer to this thing here as, let's call it matrix D, then what we're really doing is starting with the form AX equals B and turning it into the form DAX equals DB. We're multiplying on the left by the same diagonal matrix on both sides. So that's why this is a valid thing to do. We've we started with an equality, we multiply by the same matrix on both sides of the equality, so what we end up with also has to be an equality. It's a little trickier to see for the other steps, but actually multiplying or adding or removing of one row from another set of rows can also be represented as a matrix operation. In particular, if we're trying to take one row and subtract it from the rows below it, that can be represented as a matrix operation that looks like the following, multiplying by a matrix that has ones everywhere on the diagonal, and then in one column of that matrix below the diagonal, we have these terms minus, let's call it A1, minus A2, et cetera. Yeah, so these would be the factors by which we are multiplying individual elements to remove them from the things below in the particular row. And that is going to perform the operation that we see, let's say, well, in this case, it would be moving from this matrix to this matrix. So that operation of multiplying below the matrix, we could represent as simply taking all of the elements of the first row and then putting the coefficients, those multiplying factors here, so we can get a minus A1, minus A2. And the key point of that is that what we're going to end up with here is, in particular, a lower triangular matrix. So each of the steps where we're subtracting 
elements of one row or multiples of one row from the rows below them will give us lower triangular matrices. So does anyone remember what the definition of a lower triangular matrix was? It's when you have values uh, in the lower left, you have zeros in the upper right. Yeah, so everything here is zero. And when we reverse direction, we start putting zeros above the diagonal, each step of that can be represented as multiplying on the left by something that will look like this. So we can have, let's say, minus P1, minus P2, minus P3, et cetera. So in other words, multiplying <coughs> by an upper triangular matrix. We'll return to that a bit later. But the important point here is that every step of Gaussian elimination is equivalent to multiplying the left and right sides of the equation by a matrix. So does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so that is kind of why Gaussian elimination is an acceptable thing to do. But I want to return then to the question of what are we actually doing when we perform Gaussian elimination. Right, so, particular, what I want to do is write down some pseudocode for what we actually did when we went through this, and then we can see in a bit more detail what's going on, consider some potential problems with Gaussian elimination. So when we're going through the Gaussian elimination process, what we're doing is basically the following. We're saying that we go through elements of the diagonal, i equals 1 to n, so we're walking through a series of diagonal elements, and for each of those, we're going to scale the diagonal, and that will work basically as follows. We're going to scale the B element, so BI gets BI over AII. So AII is the diagonal element. We're trying to divide everything by that. And then we say for K gets N down to, G, down to I, AIK gets AIK divided by AII. So in other words, we are simply scaling each of the elements by AII, and then when we're done with that, we have scaled one row of our matrix. We're then going to use that row to subtract from the rows below it. So let's do that by saying for J gets I plus one to N, so for all the rows below diagonal element in position II, BJ gets BJ minus Bi Aji over Aii. So Aji divided by Aii is going to be the multiplicative factor for that particular row. And for k gets n down to i, Ajk gets Ajk minus Aik Aji over Aii. So this is clearing out all the elements uh, below the diagonal. Question. Are these nested loops or is it separate? Uh, these are nested loops. I'm trying to show that with indentation. That, uh, yeah, so. so is that uh, clear? OK. All right, so at this point, and when we run through this loop, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up having cleared out all of the uh, elements. Or excuse me. This, yeah. See, these two are at the same nesting. Yeah, this one should also be at the same nesting level. All right, so then we're going to need to reverse direction and say for i gets n down to 2, for j gets i minus 1 down to 1. Bj gets Bj minus Bi Aji, and Aji gets zero. So that is simply reversing direction. It's a little simpler because we already have ones on the diagonal then. But basically what we've done is gone through the entire matrix. We've uh, put ones on our diagonals. We've cleared out below the diagonals. We've cleared out above, above the diagonals. Does that make sense to everyone? 
Okay, so this process may not work in every case. So there are situations where this can actually fail, uh, uh, effectively produce an error as we're trying to go through the Gaussian elimination process. Can anyone see where it can go wrong? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so a singular matrix is going to create a problem here. So can you say why that would create a problem? Because essentially we're trying to multiply A inwards with that to get the identity matrix. matrix. So if the inverse doesn't exist, then we can't get to the identity matrix. Yeah, and in terms of the pseudocode, where is that going to throw an error? Where would the code crash if you wrote this up and ran it on the singular matrix? Well, the place it will go wrong is really here. So where this can fail is if we're running through this process, and if we have a singular matrix, what will happen is at some point, we'll get to AII, and AII will be zero. So that's what's going to go wrong. We'll end up dividing by zero. So if at any point during this process, you end up with a zero on your diagonal, there's no way of scaling that row to make that non-zero. So if you actually use Gaussian elimination in practice, you really need to do something a bit more complicated than this, because this will go wrong if the matrix is singular. And when you're working with numerical algorithms, that's, you actually need an even stronger kind of condition on this. It's not enough just to ensure that this isn't zero. You also have to ensure it's not too close to zero. So when you work with real numbers, Precision is always an issue, and dividing by small numbers is an easy way to lose all the precision in your calculations. So basically what's generally done in practice is a process called pivoting. And pivoting is basically a way of getting around the possibility that you might have either a zero or at least something close to zero in this position. And we can illustrate pivoting by taking one step in our calculations here. So let's say we were at the point where we have 1, 2, 1, 8, 3, 2, 3, 16, minus 1, 0, 2, 5. Then what pivoting would say is that we want to make sure as we go through this that we are not dividing by small things. So that we don't have small elements in any diagonal entry that we're working with. And so what we would generally do is try to rearrange to put a big number on the diagonal before we work with it. Normally this is done through what's called partial pivoting. And what partial pivoting says is that we will try permuting the rows of the matrix to put the row with the element with biggest absolute value into that position. So if we're trying to scale by the first row, we want the thing in column one that has largest absolute value moved into that position. And the way we would do that is to rearrange the matrix to be 3, 2, 3, 16, 1, 2, 1, 8, minus 1, 0, 2, 5. And then we proceed as we were before, so we would then scale by one third to shrink this row, subtract multiples of this row from the lower ones to get zeros below the diagonal, and then we would do the same thing here. Pick out the largest entry in the second column at the diagonal or below it, swap the largest one into the second row, and proceed to scaling with that. All right, so that is partial pivoting. And this will generally do somewhat better. It'll avoid most of the pathological cases and handle numerical er errors better in this Gaussian elimination process. It's worth noting that this pivoting can also be represented as a matrix operation. So this is still a valid thing to do. Pivoting is equivalent to multiplying by what's called a permutation matrix. So the pivot we did here can be represented as multiplying on the left by the matrix 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So you multiply A and multiply B by that matrix, you get an equivalent linear system that has now swapped two of the rows. Any questions about that? 
it's still possible for things to go wrong in partial pivotings. There are cases where even that will end up doing a bad job. So sometimes people will use full pivoting. And full pivoting just means that we permute rows and columns. So when we start with this problem, we would try to put the largest element of absolute value in the entire matrix into the upper left. We would subtract below that. We would then take the submatrix below that di or, you know, below and to the right of that diagonal element and try to put the largest thing in the second diagonal position and so forth. That's not usually done in practice, but at least in theory you can show that there are cases where that's actually needed. And so any questions about that? Okay, so that basically is Gaussian elimination in practice. There are a lot more complications you can get into, so ways of more efficiently handling special structures of matrices, or more efficiently handling what are called sparse matrices. So sparse matrix is one where most of the elements are zero, but usually Gaussian elimination is not the most efficient thing to do. So if you have an n by n matrix, can anyone tell me what would be the asymptotic runtime of Gaussian elimination? Well, it would end up being an n cubed algorithm. So if you have an n by n matrix, it, it becomes an n cubed algorithm. So basically, the most deeply nested loop, what we're doing is we're walking through elements of the diagonal, and then for each of those elements of the diagonal, we have to do, well, we have to walk through the rows below that, and we have to walk through the elements of that row. So basically we're iterating over three things of length, order of n, so we end up with an n-cubed algorithm. So usually that's going to be too slow for a reasonable size of matrix, so it's something we're not going to do too often in practice. It is worth knowing, though, that there are some situations where you want to do this. So you can actually use Gaussian elimination as a way of inverting a matrix. Usually you don't want to do that either, but that's something you can do with Gaussian elimination, find the inverse of a matrix. And it does have one kind of interesting use that comes out of the uh, interpretation of the different steps of this as linear algebra operations, and that is something called LU decomposition. And the key point with LU decomposition is that if we start with a matrix A, and we've got X, and we've got a vector B, then we can think of the first step of this process as repeatedly multiplying by lower triangular or diagonal matrices. And diagonal is just a special case of lower triangular. So what we're doing is basically multiplying by a whole bunch of lower triangulars. And then in the second phase, as we move up, we're multiplying by a series of upper triangular matrices. So what we're going to end up with is that the complete Gaussian elimination process is equivalent to multiplying by a bunch of U matrices followed by a bunch of L matrices on the left and right hand sides of the equation. So it's not too hard, I think, to convince yourself that if you take two upper triangular matrices and multiply them together, you'll get an upper triangular matrix. And likewise, if you multiply two lower triangular matrices together, you get a lower triangular matrix. So this whole thing can be represented as multiplying by a U, then an L, then an A, X equals U, L, B. It's maybe a little harder to see, but also true that the inverse of an upper triangular matrix is also upper triangular, and the inverse of a lower triangular is also lower triangular. So if we are trying to solve our system in this way, what we end up concluding is that this thing, ULA, is equal to the identity matrix, which means A is equal to UL inverse, and that is going to tell us that A is equal to L inverse U inverse, where this is another lower triangular matrix L, and this is another upper triangular matrix U. 
So in other words, in performing Gaussian elimination, we're taking our matrix A and converting it into the product of a lower triangular and an upper triangular matrix. Right, so that would end up looking something like the following. We take A and we convert it into a matrix that looks like this, and a matrix that looks like this. A useful thing to do. And to see why that might be the case, imagine we've got a situation where we are trying to solve AX equals B for a series of different Bs. So we have AX equals B1, and we want to solve for the same A, a different B, and for the same A, a different B, and so on. Does anyone think of a case where we might want to do that? comes up in some applications in image analysis. We may have a particular transformation or correction we're trying to apply to a large series of images. You apply it over and over to the same images. It also has some special uses in, in modeling contexts where we, we may be interested in simulating a system. Some kinds of methods will involve repeatedly inverting the same A as we're going through iterations of evolution of this system. So this is something we sometimes want to do. And it turns out that being able to do an LU decomposition is a really useful thing if we're repeatedly solving for the same A. Can anyone figure out why that might be? What might be the advantage of having an uh, L and U? Yeah. Probably some work in the decomposition that gets repeated every time you do this. So LU, you can do it once every time you use it. Yeah. So if we have, let's say, a matrix, say an L, and we just try to solve this matrix Lx equals to B, this is much easier to solve than a completely filled in matrix, because we know we have just one element in the first row, so we know that one, or whatever that is, times the, the element x1 of x, has to be the element B1 of B, so we can solve that easily. In the next row, we have two elements filled in. We know what one of them is, so we can solve the next one. Next row, we've got three elements, and we figured out what two of them are. Basically, what we've done is instead of needing n cubed time, we only need n squared time to solve for a, a system of the form Lx equals B. And the same is true if it's ux equals b. You only need n squared time to solve for that. And so if we know that a can be decomposed as lu, then we can say that we're trying to solve the system lux equals b. And we'll just turn that into two systems, ly equals b, where y is ux, solve for y. We know l and b. And then we solve ux equals y. At this point, we know y, we know u, so we can get x. And both of those steps now are n squared steps. So if we do the n cubed work once for the Gaussian elimination, now doing n squared work, we can solve each new, uh, each new b for that one matrix. Does everyone follow that? Okay, so that's basically one reason why Gaussian elimination is worth knowing. It is a useful thing if you need to solve repeatedly for the same matrix. All right, so for the most part, though, people don't really use Gaussian elimination for hard systems. I'm going to briefly mention what replaced Gaussian elimination, and only briefly because something else came along and replaced that, but these methods I'm going to tell you about are also good to know about for some contexts. And these are called the classic iterative methods. So the classic iterative methods are something that doesn't give us an exact algorithm in the sense of saying we run for a certain number of steps and then we're done. These methods tend to work by saying we'll start with an initial guess, so some idea of what x is to solve ax equals b, and then given that initial guess, what we're going to do is apply a series of transformations to improve on that guess. 
And usually the observation would be that the number of transformations we need is going to be quite a bit smaller than the number of steps we would need to run Gaussian elimination. So it will usually be faster in practice. Right, so we can illustrate this by starting with the first of these methods, known as the Jacobi method. And let me just take a simple example matrix, 2, 4, 2, 3, 2, 3, minus 1, 0, 2, x1, x2, x3 is equal to 8, 6, 15. And let's suppose we have the initial guess that x is 2, 2, 2. What the Jacobi method says is that we're going to start with this initial guess and we're going to try to resolve the system one variable at a time. So we'll take the first variable, x1, and we'll say, we think we know what x2 is, and we think we know what x3 is, so let's solve again for x1. So we can just take the first row of the matrix, and we can say that first row says 2x1 plus 4x2 plus 2x3 equals 8. We think we know x2 is 2. We think we know x3 is 2. We've now got a an equation with just one variable in it. So we solve for that one variable, and we get x1 is minus 2. So just pretending we know everything except x1, solve for x1. And we then go back to our guess, and we do the same thing for the other variables. We can use the second row to solve for x2. So we can say 3x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 equals 6. We're going to pretend that our previous guess was that x1 is 2 and x3 is 2. Solve for x2 and we'll get x2 equals minus 3. And we can do the same thing using the third row to solve for x3. We're going to end up getting that x3 is 17 halves. And we would then say that our guess on the next round is minus 2, minus 3, 17 halves. And we just repeat the process. We now pretend that we know that x2 is minus 3 and x3 is 17 halves. Use the first row to solve for x1 again, and so on. And usually, if your starting guess was good enough in a relatively small number of rounds, this will converge pretty closely to the correct x1, x2, and x3. So that's the basic idea behind how an iterative method works. You can actually represent these steps as linear algebra operations themselves. So if we take out our matrix A, it's going to write this in a particular format. We can say that A is equal to, let's break this down, into a diagonal piece D, a lower triangular piece, and an upper triangular. The L and U here are not the same L and U as in LU decomposition. L is just the piece of the matrix below the diagonal. U is the piece above it. So A in this version is L plus D plus U. Then you can actually represent each Jacobi iteration as the following matrix operation. X, I plus one, your next guess as to the, the vectors is going to be D inverse L plus U, Xi plus B. And if you just keep doing this, that implements the Jacobi algorithm. So what's the asymptotic runtime of each uh, operation of this? How long does it take to run this for, let's say we have n by n matrices? It'll take n squared time. So it's easy to invert a diagonal matrix. You just invert the individual elements. That takes order n time. And then each of these, well, the addition is going to take order n squared time. You've got n squared elements. You add them pairwise. And multiplying a matrix by a vector will take n squared time. And then we've got order n to add this, n squared for the multiplication of the inverse. So we end up with n squared time. So each step of the iterative algorithm takes n squared time. For this to be useful, you would want it to take fewer than n steps in, in total for it to be asymptotically faster than Gaussian elimination. There are no guarantees, but usually that's going to be the observation. You need many fewer than n steps 
And so this is going to be a lot faster than Gaussian elimination usually. It does depend on your initial guess. If your guess is too far, it can actually diverge, so the solution gets worse on each step. But if you've got a reasonable initial guess, it tends to work well. There are a couple of other methods with a similar idea behind them. So the Gauss-Seidel method is an alternative to this, which is basically the same thing as the Jacobi method, except that each time we calculate a value of a new variable, we immediately plug that into our current guess. So we would do the same thing as the Jacobi method, except that as soon as we get this estimate x1 is minus 2, then when we go into finding a new x2, we plug in minus 2 for x1 instead of the previous guess 2. When we figure out uh, x3, we would then say that at this point we know a new value for x1, we plug that in, and we know a new value for x2, plug that in. If you make that change, you get the Gauss-Seidel method, and that can actually also be represented as simple linear algebra operator. It would come out to d minus l inverse, u xi plus b. You repeatedly apply this, you get Gauss-Seidel. The Gauss-Seidel method is, in practice, about twice as fast as the Jacobi method, but it doesn't parallelize as well. So Sometimes you actually prefer to use the Jacobi method because it's very easy to parallelize. And there's one more variant of this that's known as successive over-relaxation, or SOR. And the SOR method basically just does Gauss-Seidel, but kind of over-corrects. So you throw in an extra parameter, omega, and it has the operator xi plus 1 gets d minus omega l inverse times omega u plus 1 minus omega d x plus omega b. So basically that's just doing the same thing as Gauss-Seidel except it overcorrects on each step. And then how well it works will depend on the overcorrection parameter, but usually you can kind of speed up Gauss-Seidel a bit by having the right parameter w. So those are the classic methods. And I don't want to say too much about them. They were historically important because they replaced Gauss-Seidel. They were kind of the standard thing in practice for a while. And they actually are still somewhat useful to know because these actually sometimes make good uh, sort of heuristic nonlinear optimizers. So the same idea of fixing all the variables except one and solving for that one and repeating as you go through the variables, it's actually a nice heuristic uh, multivariable optimi optimization technique that you can use and sometimes that's a, a good thing to know about. If you need to quickly code up a multivariable optimizer, Jacobi method is often the easiest thing to do. So any questions about that? Okay, so that kind of leads us then to what people actually do today for hard systems. And what people actually do is use a class of methods known as Krilov subspace methods. And Krilov subspace methods are something that I, well, to explain, I kind of have to explain what a Krilov subspace is. So a Krilov subspace is defined by a matrix and a vector. So a matrix M and a vector V, and the Krilov subspace works as follows. So a Krilov subspace will occur in a set of families of subspaces, and the first subspace is defined simply by the vector V. So it's all the multiples of vector V, and you can think of that as a one-dimensional subspace. So V is in it, minus V is in it, 2V, 1.5V, whatever. That defines a one-dimensional space. The second Krilov subspace is defined by V and MV. So if we multiply V by M, then we get another vector. And as long as you, you don't have a pathological case where these end up parallel to each other, MV will go off in some other direction from V. So this is V, this is MV. And as long as they're not parallel, these collectively are going to define a two-dimensional space. So linear combinations of V and MV will define anything in a plane. And the same thing, you can keep going. M squared V 
as long as you don't get a pathological situation, we'll bring this out into a third dimension, and linear combinations of those three vectors will then define a three-dimensional space, and so forth. So in general, the cake krill up subspace is going to be a k-dimensional space defined by m or v, m v, m squared v up through m to the k minus one v. So is this concept of subspaces clear to everyone? Okay, so a krill up subspace method is then a method that's going to use krill up subspaces. And it is also a kind of iterative method. You can actually use it in principle as an exact method, but usually it would be used very similarly to the iterative methods. We start with kind of a guess, and then we keep improving on that guess. And the way it will work is as follows. In each round of the Krilov subspace method, let's say round one, we're going to solve the problem optimally within a successively larger Krilov subspace. So in round one, what we look for is the best solution to Ax equals b of the form, let's say, r0, a scalar, times v. So here, this would be whatever vector we're using as the basis of our first fill-up subspace. You find the best possible solution parallel to that initial vector. And then in the second round of the method, we look for the best solution of the form R0 V plus R1 M V. So the best thing in the second Krilov subspace. And then you just keep going like that. So in each round of this, you're going to solve the problem optimally within a successively larger Krilov subspace. Now, if you actually kept running that out to n rounds, then this would be an exact linear system solver. Because at the end of n ra m rounds, as long as you didn't hit one of these pathological cases, You've defined an n-dimensional subspace, which is the entire space you're working in. You're solving optimally in the n-dimensional subspace. You actually solve the linear system. But what makes these methods work, or one of the things that makes them work, is that like the classic iterative methods, it's usually been observed in practice that you don't need to get anywhere near round n. Very quickly, you will tend to get very close to the actual solution to the problem. So you usually need to go a, a fairly small number of rounds, much less than n. And that makes this more efficient than Gaussian elimination, typically more efficient than the classic iterative methods. Yeah? How exactly do you choose n and v? Yeah, so I'll come to that. It, it's, uh, there are some standard versions of this that have those choices typically made for you. A, a standard thing to do with v is just use b. So to say b is v, and that seems to work out well often in practice. And m is very often actually going to end up being a. But the, the, the methods kind of have that built in. Another question? Well, how do you choose the starting point? Where is the, where do you choose k? I mean, near some set point to iterate. How do you make that initial guess? Uh, well, usually, the initial guess is effectively the vector v that you're using to define the krill up subspace. So very often you just use b. It, it, it really shouldn't matter too much what you pick there, but b is often a good choice for that. So, uh, yeah, I think some of this it may be easier to explain if I get to a specific example of a krill up subspace method. And let me start by showing you kind of the most generic Krilov subspace method. So this is one that is less efficient than it's possible to make these, but really captures, in the, the very generic sense, what a Krilov subspace method is supposed to do without any assumptions on the inputs you're giving it. And generally, the faster methods will make assumptions about the matrix that may or may not be true for all matrices. So the generic Krilov subspace method is something called the generalized minimal residual, or GM res method. And GM res is defined for any Ax equals B 
And here we're going to make the decision that the matrix M will be A and the vector V will be B. So we just use those to define our draw-up subspace. And what we're going to try to do is solve this problem in successive rounds, where on each round we're finding the optimal X according to the following definition. We're trying to minimize on each round the length of AX minus B. And this quantity AX minus B is known as the residual. So the length of the residual is a measure of how close your X has gotten to solving the problem. So we're trying to do on each round of this, find the X pseudocode here and try to explain as I go what this pseudocode is doing. What we're going to do first is try to define our first Krilov vector, we'll call that Q1, and that will be simply B, except that we will normalize it. So we'll want these to be normalized so to length one. So we divide B by its length. And then we're going to do the following. For I gets one to N. So I'm going to write this as if we were running the algorithm to completion. Normally you wouldn't really run it out to N. You'd have some test of convergence and quit when it uh, gets close enough. What we're going to say is V gets a times Q sub i. So V then is our guess for the next Krilov vector. So this is the previous vector times uh, our matrix. And then we're going to do the following. So we say for J gets 1 to i, HJI gets QJ transpose V, and V gets V minus HJI QJ. So what this is doing is orthogonalizing our next Krilov vector by the prior ones. So if our previous Krilov vector is going in this direction, our next one goes in this direction, what we're trying to do is find the projection of the, the new one on all of the previous ones. So we can subtract out the component of them that's parallel and end up with the component that is perpendicular. So that's what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to get a perpendicular set of basis vectors that define the k krilov subspace. Does that make sense to everyone? OK, so once we've done that, we, what we'll do is we'll say, we'll, we'll just keep these values, hi plus 1, i gets the length of v, and q i plus 1 gets v divided by h i plus 1 i. So this is just normalizing the next Krilov vector. So we now have a version of that in unit length. And then what we're going to do is the following. We are going to find y minimizing the following. A times a, a matrix that I will refer to as capital Q sub i, where this matrix has in each of its columns one of these Q sub i, so one of these orthogonalized, normalized Krilov vectors up to Q sub i plus 1. So each of these defines a column of Q times y minus b. And we want to minimize that over y. So what this is doing is basically the operation of finding the best x within the Krilov subspace. So this is saying that y gives us the set of coefficients to multiply the vectors defining the Krilov subspace by. So we take some component of each of these vectors, and qi times y is our guess xi. So qi times y is going to give us a vector xi that is in the uh, i Krilov subspace, in the i plus first, or however we define it. And that then is going to be our best guess at step i. Now, I haven't told you yet how to solve this, but we get to that a little later. But for now, just take my word for it that we can find the y that minimizes the value of this. And then once we've done that, we simply take this xi, and that is our next guess. 
And as I mentioned, you could run this for all n steps. If you had exact arithmetic, you would end up with the actual exact solution to the problem. But usually what you're going to do is test the size of the residual or something equivalent. And when this quantity gets small enough, you just say it's good enough. And usually that will only take a few rounds. So that basically is all there is to the generalized minimal residual method. And if you understood this algorithm as it described it, you basically understand Krillop subspace methods. So any questions about any of that? Okay, so there are some other Krillop subspace methods that I'm not going to go into. Uh, uh, yeah? I actually do have a question. When would you use this? Uh, well, usually, you mean when would you use this method in particular or Krillop subspace method in general? Oh. Uh, well, basically, if you're solving a hard linear system, a Krillop subspace method is usually the thing you would want to do. What do you mean hard? Um, if, if it's big enough that you can't run Gaussian elimination oh, on so it. Big. Okay. Uh, well, well, there's more to hard than big with these things, but that's, that, that's one important parameter. Uh, uh, there, there's kind of a general issue with these, and if you're going to explain a little about it, I can just mention now that runtime of these kinds of methods is not as easy to analyze as runtime of your standard discrete algorithms. So because it depends on how many rounds it takes to get a good solution, you generally can't just say, this is an n cubed method, or this is an n squared method. Each round of this will require order n squared time, but the number of rounds you need depends on something called the condition number of the matrix. And the condition number, you generally write this as a kappa, is defined, and there are different ways you can define this, but basically, if you remember how we define norms of matrices, it's basically the norm of the matrix times the norm of the inverse of the matrix, and that seems to be kind of the key parameter for deciding how many rounds you need to run to get a good solution. So basically, if you are, if kappa times n squared is much smaller than n cubed, because n is big and cap is not so big, then these methods will tend to do better than Gaussian elimination. Is there any other questions? Okay, so there are other versions of these, so I'm not going to go into all, all of the different ways you can do this. In the text, I refer to one important method, actually the first of these ever developed, called the conjugate gradient method. And the conjugate gradient method is a faster way of doing what GM res does. Essentially, this loop here it gets rid of because it has a way of doing the math in a somewhat more clever way where you only have to orthogonalize each vector by the one previous vector. You don't have to go back and orthogonalize it by all of the others. But to do that, it makes a very important and limiting assumption about the matrix. It has to assume the matrix is, and this is a term we'll see a number of other times in this class, what is called positive definite. So positive definiteness is a concept that comes up a lot in uh, numerical mathematics so in linear algebra context. And there are a lot of sort of equivalent ways of defining it. So one that is useful is that it means that x transpose ax has a length greater than or equal to zero for any vector x. So if that's true, a is positive definite. Another one is that all eigenvalues are positive. And then there are various other things you can test. So the conjugate gradient method only works if A is positive definite. It turns out that a lot of kind of natural or physical matrices that come up in modeling contexts are in fact positive definite, so it's less of a restriction than you might think, but it is a restriction you need to be aware of. You don't need that for GM res, but conjugate gradient is a way to do this faster if you have that. There is kind of a way around that that's sometimes used, and that is to run a method called the biconjugate gradient method. 
And the biconjugate gradient method just says, instead of solving Ax equals b, what we will do is solve A transpose Ax equals A transpose b, and solve that biconjugate gradient. And this works because A transpose A is always going to be positive definite. So if you have any x, x transpose A transpose A x is going to be equal to A x transpose A x, which is just taking a dot product of a vector with itself. So as long as that's a, a real value vector, what we're going to end up with is taking the sum of the squares of the terms of x. So this is going to have a value greater than or equal to 0. So for any a, or any real valued a, a transpose a is going to be uh, symmetric, or is going to be positive definite. And we can use conjugate gradient. So why, why not just do that all the time? Why, why would we even bother with conjugate gradient if we can run by conjugate gradient and that works on any matrix? Yeah, and it actually comes down again to this concept of the condition number. When you convert from A to A transpose A, essentially you're approximately squaring the condition number. So the number of rounds you need is going to be approximately squared by the biconjugate gradient method. So generally you don't want to do this unless you have to do it. It may be actually slower than working with the, or, well certainly it'll be slower than conjugate gradient if your matrix was originally positive definite and maybe slower than GM res or some other alternatives. All right, so any questions about any of that? And so one other thing I want to mention in the context of these Krilov subspace methods, which is really important in practice if you're working with them, is something called a preconditioner. So usually you're not going to need to write code for a Krilov subspace method. It's any modern language, it's very easy to get your hands on libraries for linear algebra that are very highly optimized that will have all of these standard kinds of methods. But you do need to know some things about them to use them effectively, and preconditioners are probably the most important thing to know about. And a preconditioner has to do with the fact that usually you don't actually directly solve Ax equals b. What you actually will solve is a system m inverse A x equals m inverse b. And m is a matrix that's called the preconditioner. So m is something you supply to the algorithm. And the idea is that you want to give it a preconditioner that makes this easier to solve. And this essentially comes down again to the concept of condition number. The idea behind M is that you want something where it's really easy to compute M inverse A, but M inverse A has a smaller condition number than A. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so the matrix with smallest condition number is actually the identity matrix. So for the identity matrix, the condition number is 1. That's the smallest a condition number can be. So the ideal M is something that turns A into approximately the identity matrix. Now the ideal thing to do that would be to make M equal to A, because then M inverse A is A inverse A, which is I. But obviously you can't do that, because if you could, you're solving a linear system. So you need to run through all of this. Now if you want to make M easy to compute, you want something that is sort of like the identity matrix. It's very easy to invert the identity matrix. So that's kind of the engineering challenge here. You have to balance the fact that you want M inverse to be sort of like computing A inverse against the fact that you want M inverse to be something that you can compute really quickly. And that there's no necessarily standard way that will work well every time. It can be a hard challenge. Many of these codes, kind of the default thing to do is to say that M will be equal to just the diagonal of A. So just pull out the diagonal of A. That's very easy to invert. 
and if you divide it, if you multiply A by its diagonal inverse, that often does a pretty good job of shrinking its condition number. So that's a standard sort of thing to do if you don't have a better idea. It's also worth noting that usually you don't explicitly supply a matrix to a routine like this. One of the kind of nice things about these Krilov subspace methods is that they never actually need you to give them the matrix, matrix explicitly. The only thing you ever do with the matrix is multiply vectors by it. So usually when you use a routine like this, what you actually give the, the function is a function that multiplies vectors by your matrix. And that can make a big difference because many matrices are very sparse. So a huge matrix, you may never want to explicitly represent all the elements in it. You just want a routine that does the effect of multiplying vectors by that matrix. And the same is true of preconditioners. You don't explicitly create this preconditioner, which could be a huge matrix. You just give the linear algebra package a function that does the operation of multiplying by a matrix. So that's just some practical information for how we would work with these things. Any other questions? What's the use case where you're trying to solve a really large or hard linear system? Uh, well, well, there are. I guess there are, there are a lot of cases that might come up where we're trying to do this. So we'll see a number of them as we go in, through this class. It, it can be that these regression models, that you can have a very complicated regression model that comes up in numerical integration, some kinds of integration methods. You may be looking at a big system of uh, coupled equations, and then each step of the integration, we're inverting a matrix. So it, it uh, yeah, it's, a, it's hard to pin down the specific example that comes up everywhere in numerical computing. But uh, yeah, I, I, I assume I'll find some things to put on your homework that will give you more concrete examples, or you can look in the text or some. But uh, it, basically, it just comes up everywhere. Any other questions? All right, so one last thing I wanted to say before we leave for the day is to come back to an issue I mentioned back towards the beginning of this class, and that is, what do we do with overdetermined or underdetermined systems? So I've now told you more or less how people work in practice with full rank systems, but very often we're going to have an overdetermined or underdetermined system. So overdetermined systems are usually something we actually want in these sorts of data fitting contexts, because if you have experimental error, you want some redundancy to bring down that error. And the problem is, if we have an overdetermined system, we have more equations or more constraints than unknowns. Usually, you can't exactly solve the system. But very often, what we actually do in practice is something like what we're doing in these steps of the uh, uh, Krilov subspace methods, we, what we will try to do is minimize the residual. So ax minus b, and we'll try to find an x that minimizes the residual across all of our equations. So you can basically think of it that if we have some system of equations, then each of those equations is going to be some it's going to have some value b associated with it. We try to find the x such that the sum of squares of errors between the ax's and the b's across all of our constraints is minimized. And that's equivalent to minimizing the length of the residual. So this you might also see referred to as a least square solution. So it's minimizing the sum of the squares of the errors. It's kind of the standard thing to do. And it turns out there is a very simple way to do that. So the least squares solution to ax minus b in cases where a is an overdetermined system is going to be the solution to a transpose ax equals a transpose b. A transpose a is always going to be a square matrix. So when we solve for a transpose ax equals a transpose b, this is going to end up full rank. And it turns out the solution to this is least square solution to this. So that's sort of the standard thing we would do in, a, uh, in one of these uh, overdetermined systems. And it's also worth noting that that is the answer to something I've left out here. How do we find the y minimizing this thing in the generalized minimal residual method? What we're doing here is exactly solving a minimal residual of an overdetermined system. 
And so you just use this formula here. So what we would say is we're trying to find the y minimizing aqy minus b, and we would represent that by saying that we are solving aq transpose aq y equals aq transpose b. And this turns out to be not such a bad thing to do because Q is a very narrow matrix. And so what we're going to end up doing is we get kind of our big matrix A times this narrow matrix Q. The result is going to be a narrow matrix, narrow matrix transpose times narrow matrix is going to be a small matrix. So basically, each step of that, we're solving a linear system where this thing is a pretty small yeah, k by k matrix and the length k vector is a very tiny system. So it's easy to do as long as we're not too many rounds into the genome res. All right, so any questions about that? OK, so that leaves the last thing, and that is underdetermined matrices. So an underdetermined matrix means that there is an infinite number of solutions. And one answer to this is that if we have an underdetermined matrix, we can just pick one solution. You can just start fixing variables, you just make up arbitrary values until enough variables are fixed that your system is full rank and then solve it. That's kind of arbitrarily picking one solution. Another way of handling this is that we can add an objective function. So in other words, we've got an infinite space of solutions. We can throw an objective function on those solutions as some way of saying that some are better than others. And that actually gives us what we'll be seeing a week from now, and that is what's called a constraint optimization problem. So if you do that, then what we end up with is a problem in which we're trying to optimize for some objective function relative to a set of constraints. That's what constrained optimization means, and then we'll see in a week the methods for that. One final thing you can often do is use something called a pseudo-inverse. And a pseudo-inverse is something that does the following. We take the singular value decomposition, which you may remember can be represented as u transpose sigma v, where sigma is a matrix that has the singular values on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. And in the pseudo-inverse, we just invert all the singular values that are non-zero or far from zero if we want to avoid numerical errors, and then turn all the others into zero. That's known as the pseudo-inverse. If you do this exactly for the ones that are non-zero, then if your matrix is invertible, it, it will work. If it's not invertible, it will give you a something that's often written as A plus, where you can just say A plus B is your X. And if A is invertible, this is equivalent to solving the linear system. If it's not invertible, it has the nice property of finding the X that has minimal Euclidean length among all the X's that solve the system. So it's kind of a handy default thing to find, in a sense, the simplest solution to, the, to uh, your linear system. And that's something we would often do in these cases. So I think we are out of time at this point. Are there any last questions before we break for the day? Okay, then I guess next time we'll get into continuous optimization.